by conspiracy of circumstances, I have the opportunity to introduce today's uh, list. Are you listening to me? Do you hear me at all? OK. I'm saying that by conspiracy of circumstances, I have the privilege to introduce tonight's guest lecture, lecturer. Uh, the lecture this evening on contemporary African writing will be delivered by Bernard N. Fonlong from the United Republic of Cameroon in West Africa. Bernard Fonlong was educated at Christ the King College and Bigat Memorial Seminary in Nigeria, the National University of Ireland, the Sorbonne in France, and the University of Oxford in England. He has been Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Transports, Post and Telecommunications, Minister of Public Health and Social Welfare, and Chargé de Mission in the Presidency of the United Republic of Cameroon. He is currently the head of the Department of African Studies at the Uni University of Cameroon, West Africa. Dr. Falong is co-founder and director of the Cameroon Cultural Review, ABIA. He is author of five books and scores of articles on African contemporary developments. One of his books, To Every African Freshman, or The Nature, End, and Purpose of University Studies, has won wide continental acclaim in African universities and institutions of higher learning. Dr. Falong, who is currently a visiting professor at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln, has been brought to Iowa State thanks to the initiative of Mr. Peter LaSalle of the Department of English following his trip to Cameroon last summer and the active support of Dr. Charlotte Brunner of our Department of Foreign Languages. Dr. Falong is fluent in six languages and tonight he has agreed to give his lecture in English. Let us welcome Dr. Falong to Iowa State. First of all, let me thank uh, Dr. Peter LaSalle, uh, who was instrumental in bringing me here. And uh, uh, all those who, in one way or the other, have made my stay here so enjoyable. Now, uh, I'm happy to be speaking at this time because I hope that there'll be time for discussion. I do not come here as somebody involved with all knowledge and has just to give out and others to, uh, to absorb. But I come as some somebody who has a few ideas which he can share with others and, uh, and I hope that there will be a discussion. I hope that it will not, will not be as what happens during, uh, during the day. You see, when I have to give a talk uh, between classes, you know, and people have to rush uh, from one class to the other, and then, you know, um, you don't get a feedback. So that's what I am hoping for. Now, my uh, uh, topic is um, contemporary African literature. Now, uh, let me say that in so far as my department is concerned, when we talk of African literature, 
uh, we give to the word African a meaning that transcends the boundaries of Africa. We mean writings not only by Africans, but by people of African descent, wherever they may be. That is why, for instance, in my department, we study I mean, uh, the uh, American, the, uh, the study of African Americans, as I would call them, because they are confused as to what they should be called. Sometimes they, they, they were, there was a time when they were called Africans. Then they said, no, we should be called Afro-Americans or Afro-Americans. Then they said, no, let's, let us be called Negroes with a capital N, N, N. And today, I hear they say, no, we don't want Negro, we want the word black. But I say, why not African? So when we talk of African literature, we mean all the literature, I said, produced by Africans and people of African descent, whether they're in the United States, in the Caribbean, or wherever else they may be. That is why exactly uh, 10 years ago, I went to Russia on a pilgrimage to visit the village where Pushkin lives, in Mikhailovskoye, uh, in the north of Russia. Because Pushkin was, a, a, was a, a Russian writer of African origin, and he, never, he was never embarrassed by that, of his African origins. And uh, I went there, I saw his house, no, and I saw his library. I saw the picture of his ancestor, African ancestor, there, well preserved by thanks to the Russian government. Uh, <clears throat> so we we teach Pushkin in our in our in our department. We also teach Antar. Antar was uh, uh, was a black among the Arabs. And he died exactly 10 years before Muhammad began Islam. And his poetry figures among what the Arabs call the Ma'alakat, that is the exalted poetry that is hung over the black stone in the Kaaba. And he was black. And he, he talks about his being black. And in praise of night, you know, he says, for instance, if night is not if there's no night, how can you, uh, um, how can you um, appreciate the beauty of the moon, for instance? And uh, as I said somewhere ago, students riot here in the United States in Watts, and they say black is beautiful, and they think they have found a new idea that nobody had before, and they forget that Anta had talked about black being beautiful before Muhammad founded Islam. And that even the Bible, if you go back to the Bible, see the number of African references. Uh, uh, Solomon wrote, I mean, Solomon had uh, a harem of about 700 wives, I am told. But he wrote his best poem, which is called the Canticle of Canticles, or the Song of Songs, on the black one, you know? And he, he, he makes her speak in his poem, and she says, Nigra sum sed formosa. I am black, but beautiful. Why but? She just said, I am black and beautiful. Just as, as they can be white and ugly. They can be yellow and ugly. They can be black and ugly. And they can be, what, they can be black and beautiful, you see? So these are, these are themes. I mean, this is uh, our perspective, our view of the African world. Now, I held this view m myself long ago, and I found the department on that. Now, and this year, I was invited to the uh, conference on the African diaspora in, in Howard University in Washington, D.C. And there they were talking, there, there were people of African origin from every part, every part of the world. And they were insisting that there is an Africa outside of Africa. There I said nothing. Because I had come to listen to see whether, to hear 
whether my idea was correct. And I found that, by and large, I was uh, vindicated in Washington, D.C. this year. Now, that is what we talk about when we talk about uh, African literature, what we mean. But of course, we, uh, in one evening, I cannot talk of the whole of African literature. We, ha we will have to uh, select a few, th uh, I mean, a few uh, uh, writers and a few themes to illustrate our talk this evening. Now, um, I look at contemporary African literature uh, in, in the light of the Hegelian, Hegelian philosophy. Hegel said, Nothing is, all is becoming. He would say, there are philosophers who, who emphasize being. There are others who emphasize nothingness. But the truth is neither in being, neither is it in, uh, in, in nothingness, but it is in becoming. Everything is becoming. We are in the process of change at every moment of our lives. What you are now is not what you were yesterday, nor what, what you were last year. So there's a process of becoming. And by and large, Hegel was right. Therefore, becoming is a compromise between being and non-being. Now, and I look at Africa this way. I look at it as portrayed in the literature. There is a literature that talks about the Africa that was, the Africa that had existence the Africa that had respect. Then came certain movements which reduced the African into not to nothing, no? There was first slavery uh, in which both the whites and the blacks, uh, that should be you know, emphasized, no? That the blacks took part in slavery. They're sold, they're, they're they are fellow blacks to the whites, and sometimes whites came if there were there were no Africans available to be to be sold. They went hunting for them, and uh, the African was taken as a slave. Not were they. Not only uh, was this move uh, were, were the uh, promoters of this movement content with slavery, they came to Africa, and they took over Africa, and the African from being uh, somebody became nothing or at best a thing. And like other things, he was for sale. Now, and this literature hammers on this part of, uh, on, this, on these themes. Now, so you see you have on the one side, the Africa that was the glorious Africa of the empires of the great traditions, and then uh, the Africa in exile. And then you have a movement back to Africa. There's a back to Africa movement. Physically, there was a back to Africa movement. That's why you have places like Liberia, like uh, uh, Sierra Leone. These are countries were created by Africans who came back to Africa. And there are others who are dispersed in other parts of Africa and uh, who do not form a, uh, a country or a state. For instance, if you go to Lagos or to Cotonou or to Abome, you'll find people with names like De Souza, Santa Cruz, and so on. And then you begin to say, but how? How come they are given these names? There are descendants of Africans who came from, from Brazil to Africa. Now, in, in the same way, the African tried to come back to himself, and that is portrayed in literature by revolt and a recognition of uh, the Africa that has been maligned, that has been described as being barbaric. There's nothing good comes out of Africa. Only a single vo voice finds that, it, that uh, uh, a <coughs> Latin author who said, ex Africa sempre quid novi. From Africa, there's always something new, you know? And uh, in spite of what I said, the, <clears throat> the African 
came back to himself, and some returned physically to Africa, some, re some returned in a romantic sense in, to Africa, some recognized their African origins while staying where they, uh, remaining where they were. And that is reflected in the literature. Now, let, us give, let me give examples of authors who have treated these things to make the thing concrete. Now, you have, for instance, an author like uh, Chino Achebe. Chino Achebe is a Nigerian. He's an Igbo. And uh, one of the works that he has written uh, uh, that is very outstanding, I think it has won um, an international prize, and is the one that I admire most is Arrow of God. Arrow of God is a novel, and it is written around a character, a character that is a, a priest, an African traditional priest, who has a god of who, whom he is a guardian. Mind you, who is a priest, he guards his god. The god protects the, the tribe. You see, and uh, you had the, the, the situation of Africans in Achebe's book worshiping a god that they themselves had made. You see, and this chief priest is in, in a war with his clan because they are going against the law of the gods by making, by waging an unjust war. You know, and so the conflict, there's a conflict between him and his own clan because of an unjust war, as I have said, and there's conflict between him and the British administration because the administration wanted to create chiefs because the British had the system of indirect rule, and they wanted to create chiefs. And the, 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 the attitude was that every African was a liar, you know? They were almost, they would lie even to spoil a good case. They lie. So the, this, this, uh, the, the, uh, the administrator, Winterbottom, sees this uh, Ezeulu as a man of dignity and of truth, and he decides to make him a chief. And Ezeulu says, no, I will not be anybody's chief. I am a priest, and I worship my god. And he is caught and arrested, you know. And so the action goes on until finally he is, uh, his doom is sealed. You know, in the, in, in, it's a very interesting novel, and one, would, I would, um, one that I would recommend for lovers of African literature, modern African literature, to read. There you have an African society that has dignity. You know what Achebe wants to say in in, in, in brief is that the Af African culture, uh, which is regarded as being barbarian and all that, was capable of producing people of 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 of, uh, of high moral integrity. That's what he's, that is what he's saying in, in that uh, work. Um, on the other hand also, you have a writer like uh, Stanley Samkange. Samkange is from Rhodesia. And he wrote a history book the orig on the origins of Rhodesia. And Following the history book, he wrote, he wrote a novel, which is the history fictionalized. And it's entitled, On Trial for My Country. And anybody who's interested in the history of uh, Rhodesia uh, would, would be well advised to read both the book, uh, both the novel and the book. Now, in this novel, uh, Samkange relates the story of how Cecil Rhodes, by wiles and guiles, uh, seized the, the territory of an African king. There you had an African kingdom which was established, which was a branch of the Zulu, uh, Zulu uh, of Chaka's empire, because Mzilikazi, uh, who founded, who was the first king, 
broke away from uh, Chaka and founded this other um, state, which is now called Rhodesia. Uh, and um, in the in the in the book, Sam Kange uh, tells of how he left Bulawayo to go to a certain town in Rhodesia. And uh, uh, after 30 miles, he found that he was in the wrong direction. So he, t he, he, he tried to reverse, but his car went into a ditch. And in spite of the fact that it was new, he tried to start it, and it wouldn't start. So he comes out of the car. He sees the uh, Matupo Hills, and there's a village on the, on the hills, near the hills. So he, was, he, he left the car and was going to the village to get people to help him to uh, get this car out of the ditch. But as, as he came, uh, the further he came, uh, the village seemed to be receding, you know. So he gave up the search and was coming back. And he found a cave. And in the cave was an old man before a fire. So as a good African, he enters the cave and greets my father, because every old man is my father. If you're young, an old man's your father. I said, he, gre he greeted his father, and then this man said, yes, I greet you, Sam Kange, Sam Kange of this, and of this, of that, and began reciting his genealogy far back into the centuries. And then Sam Kange says, does my father know me? And he said, I not only know you, but I brought you here. Because there are things that I, that I saw which I want you to go and tell. That's how the novel begins. I died, he said, and uh, I was about to be buried. And I woke up, and people got frightened and fled. And uh, now this is what I saw when I went into the other world. I saw the great lion, Mzilikazi and the, his Indunas in council. And before them, the King Lubengula on trial for having sold the, uh, the, the territory, the land, and so on, to the white man. Then since in the, out, in, 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 in the afterworld, there's no question of, no, there are no difficulties of language and space, I looked over, and there I saw England, and there was Cecil Rhodes being tried by his father in a church for having betrayed Christian principles, because his father was a churchman, and for having seized an African king's kingdom. And so the story goes on, you know. You, you see uh, the Mzilikazi's version told, and you see Lubengla's version told. And the skill of the work is, lies uh, not only in the, in the matter of it, the story that it tells, but the way it is told. When the Africans are telling the story, although it's in English, you see that these are Africans. To give you an example, for instance, uh, at one point, uh, Lubengula, when he saw that he had been, he had been uh, fooled into signing a treaty which so, took away all his land, sent an embassy to England. And you see the ambassadors in the novel now recount what, how they went to England, you know? And they, they begin by saying that we went down to Cape Town to see the Queen's Induna. And Induna means being, being a chief, you know, of the, under a king. And we went there to ask him for the road. What do you see? Look at the sea. I mean, how can you be asking for the road when, they say, when you're going by sea? You see, we went to ask him for the road. Now, that's an Africanism for asking for permission. In African languages, by and large, you will hear people saying, ask, we're asking for the road. You know, and that means asking for permission. And they, they'll say, we went there to be the ears and the eyes and the mouth of the king. White men don't talk like that, by and large. You see, and that this is how the, the novel, is, the, the story is told, very beautifully. That's one example, Samkange, 
and uh, Achebe. Now you have other other um, examples that I can give. For instance, there there are the uh, writings of my countrymen. There's uh, Ferdinand you know, who is who is now uh, ambassador to the United Nations. He wrote two books, which have made him really very famous, at least in Cameroon. Envy the boy. Envy the boy. Say a boy means I mean, a servant, you know, envy the boy. And there he describes how uh, uh, an African, a young African who is employed by a French commandant. A commandant means uh, an administrator, high, high rank, the highest ranking administrator. Uh, and then, you know, he, is, he portrays the life of the whites there in, in the book. And of course, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, a satire, you know, a satire on, on the French colonial system. I went to France in 58 to congratulate Oyono for his book. And you know that in 58 he was beaten in the streets of Paris for having <laughs> written that book. And then he went on to write another, um, Le Vieux Negre et la, et la Médaille. The old Negro and the medal. He tells the story of a man who gave his land uh, to the church and gave also two sons to the war. And as a, as a, as a, in compensation, the French gave him a medal. And he ended up by being beaten up that very same night by French gendarmes. No, the French term a gendarme uh, is a, a policeman. You know? It comes from gens armorum, you know? gendarme, gens armorum. And he's beaten up. You know? And there you see again the African society portrayed in the works of a writer. Now, uh, I can give other examples that tell of the Africa that was. Uh, there is, for instance, a book that looks very deceptively simple, written by a Cameroonian called Francis Bebe. Uh, Bebe wrote the book called, called Le Fils d'Agato Modio. Now, and uh, I, I am proud to, uh, uh, to say that I personally gave the imprimatur for the, for the printing of the book after studying the manuscript, because it was submitted to us of the Abia, and we read it, and we said, yes, this is a great work, and we signed, and it was printed as one of our collections. And then it was taken up by other, right, by other publish, publishing houses, and it's become a great book. Now, and what is he talking about? He's talking about the, uh, the, um, the idea that in the African society, the child is always welcome. There is no such, such thing in Africa as, as a, an illegitimate child. They can be illegitimate uh, parents, but not children. Because how can you condemn somebody for something which is not uh, of his choice? He didn't choose to be born. So you see, the, the, the story told is, is set in Douala, you see, and it tells the story very, very beautifully of a fellow uh, who married, uh, he, he wanted to marry a local girl, had to pay a dowry for her, and the in-laws kept on asking for more, and uh, finally he and his friends went and grabbed the girl and brought to his house. And then he said to himself, well, this girl is still too young, but let's let her grow up, you know. But one day he sees that she's pregnant, and having made an inquiry, he finds that it's one of his uh, friends who went and brought her with him that was responsible for, her, for the pregnancy. And he says, well, the child is there, 
well, what can we do? The child is welcome, you know, although the, the friend has made a fool of himself and has uh, abused my friendship, yet the child is always welcome. And then he falls in love with a, a girl who was run, run, running around with white people. And for that, she was looked down upon by the, by the, by the villagers. And his mother told him, if you marry that girl, that's the end between you and me. And he goes ahead and he marries. And there's a breakup between him and his mother. Then one day, his mother sees that the girl is pregnant. And there, there's a child coming, you know. And the, the quarrel is settled. And the child is born. And they found that it's a mulatto. You, know? <laughs> you see, it's... it's <laughs> You see, it's a, it's a, some of these African, Africans are very skillful, you know, in the way they put uh, very profound thought, uh, uh, philosophies or African views in very simple, very simple language. Now, uh, these were the, the themes that, were, that, that treat of the Africa before independence. The Africa that was great, the Africa that became a slave. And then, you see, I remember that in the, in the 1950s, people were saying, well, look at the Africans. They are writing against, they are writing poetry and novels against the, the whites. When they get independence, what will happen? Oh, they, of course, they will cease to write because there will be no whites to be abused. Therefore, they will not write about it. But, Contrary to expectations, African literature is flourishing more than ever. And now the African... ...has a PhD in finance. And he, has, he proposes measures that the government should take to solve the crisis. And he is denounced as a traitor and that he has been brainwashed in England and all that sort of thing. And he and his crowd are kicked out of, not only of parliament, but of the party. And half-educated fellows come in and they take over, you see? And uh, they go from one blunder to another until finally there's a, a, a coup. Mind you, this book came out in the first week of January 1966, and the Nigerian coup took place exactly <laughs> on the 15th of January 1966. <laughs> so the question was, how could Achebe have written his book in two weeks and published it in England to excite the coup makers? Or was Achebe a, a, pro, a prophet for seeing what was to come? and had written his book, and had gone the length of looking for pu publishers. And then the, pu the book had been published, and came out just when the time was ripe for a coup. Was he, uh, was he in league with the coup makers? That's the that's question. In fact, <laughs> when the counter coup took place, as the to story goes, because the uh, first coup was, uh, by and large, uh, um, made by the Igbos, Igbo officers, Igbo officers in the army. Although there were some Yorubas and Northerners there, yet they were, the Igbo element was predominant. And the man who took over, the first uh, military governor, the first military pre uh, ruler, was uh, uh, Agui Ironsi, was an Igbo. So after Sigmund, there was a backlash against the Igbos, and the counter coup took place and brought Gowan into power. And the story goes that uh, the coup makers, just as, as stupidly as soldiers can sometimes be, came in uniform to broadcasting house and said, where's Achebe? And they met a man and asked him, where is Achebe? And he said, well, you go up uh, three stories, I don't know how many, turn right, then turn this way, and you'll knock at that door, and then you'll find him but it was Achebe himself <laughs> telling him, and he took the first taxi off to, uh, to Anicha, you see? <laughs> the second coup. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, 
Now, Achebe, in his book, seems to preach uh, the gospel, I mean, the gospel that either kings should be philosophers or philosophers kings. Because he implies that the government, uh, uh, the government became uh, rotten and wicked because it was, uh, it was um, manned by half-educated uh, 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 school teachers, people who had left theater training centers, you know. They are not university men with PhDs. Now, but then, uh, another Nigerian, almost at the same time, writes his own book entitled Chief the Honorable Minister. Now, and uh, Adele Moses, Moses, who is the man, the, the, the central character, is a university man. The prime minister is a specialist surgeon. The, the, um, the, the man in charge of justice is a, is a, is a, um, is a lawyer. Specialized lawyer, he's even a QC or, I think. And yet, there's the same corruption, you know, and so on. And it ends also in a coup. So one, one begins to say, well, what, what uh, is Achebe, who is right? Is it uh, Tim Alukwo with the chief the honorable minister who shows now uh, the, uh, uh, Adele Moses, who as a student was in England, was the secretary of the Students' Union, and they were lambasting against the corrupt government at home, you see. And then he comes back at home, he, is made a, he's, he enters the government, he's given a ministry, and he ends up in the same corruption as everybody else. Well, and all of them are corrupt. That's uh, the... Uh, one might say that... Um, uh, this man, I mean, the, uh, the writer Alukwo, with Chief the Honorable Minister, um, is, is espousing the Aristotelian view. Be, because just as Plato said, either kings be philosophers or philosophers kings, Aristotle in his politics said, Good government is not the result of chance, but of science and purpose. Therefore, there must be knowledge and there must be a policy. But then he goes on very swiftly to add uh, that a government can only be good if its uh, members are good. That's uh, the Aristotelian view. And I think those... Now, there is also... Um, in the same vein, a recent book, which came out in Cameroon. And uh, it's a play called Africa Polis. It portrays an African kingdom. It's not a president, a kingdom, a king, you see. Everything is going wrong, but the ministers are all telling the president, I mean the king, everything is all right, all right, no? And the whole, the country is crumbling around them, and they're saying everything is all right. And this whole thing ends up, the country ends up, ends up in a military coup again. There's a coup. There was a, uh, uh, and um, when this, this fellow, uh, when this writer called uh, Philombe, René Philombe, presented his book, uh, no, pre he first present, the play was presented in Cameroon, but not in the capital. It was pr uh, in one of the provincial towns. And the person who provide, presided was the government official in charge of youth and sports. He presided. Now, when it came to presenting the, the, the same play in the capital, in Yaoundé, the actors developed cold feet. They came to the author and said, now look, how can we stay this play before the president and there's a coup? So let us, let us suppress the coup in the play, he said, not a line, not a line. And worst of all, the, he had a contract with the French radio to broadcast this play. But the French radio wrote to him 
saying, well, in view of the fact that uh, so many African heads of state will be offended by your uh, book, can we not change this and that? And he said he was surprised that the French, with their revolutionary history, of all peoples, should be the people to advise him to suppress uh, what he thought was um, uh, the, the, uh, the consequences of bad government. Now you see this uh, uh, in brief some of the themes that are that are that you find in in modern Africa in modern African writing before independence after independence before independence the affirmation of uh, the African uh, of the African personality of the African that the Africa that was in uh, Achebe's books in Samkange. Then uh, there is the, the there are works which portray the colonial system, where the African became a, uh, became a slave, and like other things, he was for for, so, for sale. Then independence comes, and we think the, that the things have been solved, but the situation is again one which. Uh, uh, which uh, um, prods the same writers, the writers, again to take up their pens to make war against, this time not the colonial powers, but against their own governments. And Achebe is an example. Uh, Filon, uh, René Filon bin Cameroon is an example. Um, Alukwo is an example, and there are many others. These are the mainly the, um, the themes that you find in contemporary African literature. Now, when uh, you see, when we talk of colonialism and slavery, sometimes we may say, "Well, what are these Africans? They are com they are, what are they complaining so much about? They're complaining too much." But now I am going to give you a. Uh, examples which show that what the Africans are talking about is not just uh, peculiar to the Africans alone, but it's uh, what they say and what they write is what would be said and written about by any people submitted to the same conditions at any time and in any place. Now I'll give, begin by giving examples. Now, when we talk of colonialism, and uh, you see what the Africans are doing. I mean, how they rose up, how they fought, and all that. Uh, one begins to wonder exactly whether they were not exaggerating. But now, here is, I'm citing you, I'm giving you a quotation uh, from a speech that was made by an Englishman in Kenya. He was the, the Honorable Edward Grogan. And this is what Grogan said. There are two distinct view standpoints from which I view the African. As a spectator and student of social evolution, I see a people infinitely more wise, infinitely more decent, infinitely more sane than, than we. The absolute logic of their lives bewilders, bewilders our distorted minds, says Grogan. We can never learn to understand them. They soon see through us. The other point is, the other point of view is that of a man in their midst with work to do. We are dependent upon their aid. To assist us, they must be molded in our ways, 
but they do not want to, and yet they must. Either we give up the country commercially, or we must make them work. I have, no, I have small sympathy for the capitalist regime, but it is the, un, the regime in which we, we live as yet. Until it top heavy crumbles to the ground, the native too must fall in line. We have stolen his land. Now we must steal his limbs. Compulsory labor is the corollary to our occupation of the country. I was an Englishman. That's why, you know, when, when, uh, when I was a student in, in England, I uh, liked more associating with uh, conservatives than with the so-called liberals. You know, because you, you, know, you knew what, you know that he was the enemy and you told him what you, you thought about him, and he told you what he thought, he, thought of you. And, and uh, there were people like Gorgon, you see? Uh, let me take another example. Uh, what I'm showing that people subjected to the same conditions as the Africans will react in the same way. Now, here is a text. The British have planned and established an education system which more wickedly does violence to the elementary human rights of Irish children than would, than would an edict for the general uh, castration of Irish males. The system, the system has aimed, has aimed at the substitution for men, for men and women of mere, of mere things. things. It has not, it has been, not an been an entire success. success. There are still, there are still a, great a great many thousand, thousand men, men and women in Ireland, but a great many, uh, but a great, ma but a great many thousand of what we we uh, by way of courtesy call men and women are simply things. Men and women, however depraved, have kindly human allegiances. But these things have no allegiances. And like other things, they are for sale. Patrick Pierce was an Irishman. He's not an African. Now let's take another example from another part of the world. Now, here is this text. Greed is pitiless, ignorance blind, and pride takes no heed when it crushes the small under its feet. Do not set brother against brother, woman against man. If it is your desire to strike me by the hand of one I love, then let it be fulfilled. For the sin has to ripen to, to its ugliest limits before it can bust and die a hideous death. I have not seen, uh, I have not seen a secret uh, uh, manicans strike, have I not seen secret manicans strike down the helpless uh, under the cover of hypocrisy, of the uh, of of hypocritic, uh, hypocritical might, have I not heard the silenced voice of justice weeping in solitude at might's uh, defiant outrages? Have I not seen in what agony reckless youth? runs mad, has vainly shattered its life against insensitive root rocks. I ask thee, O Lord, in tears, 
Hast thou thyself forgiven? Has even God, has even thou loved those who are poisoning the air and blotting out the light? And this is from Rabindranath Tagore. The writings of Rabindranath Tagore, and you know Tagore was a poet, an Indian poet who won um, the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1933. Now, and uh, we can go on further to give other examples. Now, uh, I talked about uh, Pierce's idea of education, what, that, what the English had done in setting up an education system in England. Now, let's look at another example. Still in, uh, I mean, n not in, in, in Ireland, but in England. But the England of many centuries ago. Now, in the, in the year 800, the Romans were ruling in Britain. They were the, they were, they, they were the, uh, they were the power in Britain. And the Roman governor at that, at that time was Tacitus. Uh, no, it was Agricola. And Agricola had a learned son-in-law, Tacitus. And Tacitus wrote the history of the governor, the governorship of Agricola in Britain. And this is what he said about his education policy. The policy, because everybody who governs must have an edu education policy. That's why, you see, if you go into any well-organized department of education, you always have the works, of, uh, uh, works like Aristotle's um, politics, uh, Plato's Republic, Plato's The Laws, because no, when you create, you are creating a society, you want to see what training to give to people to fit that society. And you must have an education theory. Now, an agricola, the, the governor, had won. And this is how it is portrayed. Namque ut homines dispersi ac rudes, eoque in bella faciles, quieti et otio, ad, et otio per voluptas assuasherent otari privatim adjuvere publice o templa fora domos extruerent laudando promptos et castigando signes. He said, uh, here Agricola saw a people dispersed, very uh, bellicose, and he thought that the best way to subdue them was to, uh, uh, to, to uh, accustom to, life of, to a life of ease. So he privately, he privately and publicly um, persuaded them to build temples, uh, the fora, like a forum in law, and houses, etc. And he praised those who were quick to uh, ad adopt his policy and castigated those who were slow. Now, and then he says, Yam uh, vero principium, filio, uh, uh, principium filios liberalibus artibus erudire, ut qui modo linguam romanam abnuebant eloquentiam concupiscerent. And he said, he got the sons of chiefs and gave them a liberal education. Why didn't he get the sons of others? I mean, he got the sons of chiefs, because they are the, the ruling class, gave them a, a liberal education. And consequently, these fellows who not long, long ago didn't know Latin were now uh, striving after eloquence. They wanted eloquence.
in the Etsyam Ed habitus nostri, ono et frequens toga. Hence it is that our way of dress has become a sign of, of honor and dignity, and the toga is often to be seen. Palatimque decesum ad delementia viciorum, porticus et balenia et conviorum elegantia, itque apod imperitos humanitas vocabatu cum par servitut, uh, uh, servitutis eset. He said, gradually they, they began to copy vices. Things like uh, baths and sumptuous festivals. And that in their simple mindedness, they called this civilization, whereas it was only a means of their enslavement. Uh, that's taken from Ag Agricola, Tacitus Agricola, Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 21. Now, uh, let's take other examples to show how um, the themes treated by the Africans are universal. Now, here is another example. An Englishman in India is different from an Englishman in England. Here in India, you belong to a system that is vile beyond description. I give you the whole of my motive when I tell you that I am impatient to, to mend or end a system which has made India subservient to a handful of you, and which has made Englishmen feel secure only in the shadow of forts and guns. A system that is responsible for such a set of things is necessarily satanic. 1,000 Indian lives against one English life is a, do is a doctrine of dark despair. That is Gandhi. So uh, there, are, there are people who have spoken in more violent language than the Africans. And now uh, there's another example. There's, uh, this is taken from a play, a play that was uh, written, oh, thank you. Now, this is taken from Irish, Irish, uh, Irish, Irish literature. I've just taken a part of it. There are two, uh, two people having a dialogue in the play. Mauchelian and Magdara. Mauchelian, he's a master.
And the Greeks say, well, no, we're only doing exactly what the nature of man dictates. And if you were in our position, you would do exactly the same. The text is in French, so uh, that's why I didn't read uh, totally. Now, then just two examples more, and we are done. Now, this one is taken from a Caesar de Bello Gallico. Now, uh, Caesar wrote the accounts of his, of his campaigns in France. And he, he faithfully reported what the, uh, the, the local sentiment was against the Romans. And the, 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 the Gauls have gathered together under a chief to make war against the Romans. And the chief is making a speech, according to Caesar. And the chief says, De populata Gallia, Cimbri, magnaque ilata calamitate, filibus quidem nostris aliquando excesserunt. Ex, 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 Atque alias terras petierunt. Jura, leges, agros, libertatemque nobis relinquerunt. He said, when the Kimbri came and defeated us and brought great, great calamity, they left us alone and sought other lands and left us with our jura, leges, agros, libertatem. Left us with our rights, our laws, our lands, and our liberty. And there's an Irishman who, who wrote, uh, say, say, who, who says, let constituents, what, let constituents say what they will. Who, he who owns your land will make your laws and will determine your destinies and your lives. So you see, the, 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 what they are talking about, they are complaining about their claiming their rights, their laws, their own laws, their own lands, and their liberty. And he goes on to say, he said, quod si ea que in longinquis nationibus geruntu ignoratis, respicite fintam galiam, que in provinciam redacta jura et I'll just give you just uh, one quotation more. And it's again from Tacitus. The British, the, the, uh, the Britons, finally decided that it was, they had had enough. And under a chief called Kagakus, they wanted to make war. And Kagakus, uh, before he, he entered the battle, uh, made a speech to his uh, soldiers. I hear that in, in more sophisticated times, they give them some drugs and so on. But in those days, they, they, they had only words to give. And then uh, this is what the chief said about the Romans. Raptores orbis, posquam cuncta vastantibus de fuere terre, yam et, ma, and, et mare scrutante, uh, scrutantum. He said this. These uh, ravagers of the world, now that they have seized all lands, they are now scouting the seas. And it says, Si locupule est hostis est avari, si papa ambitiosi. If their enemy is rich, they are, he excites their greed. If he is poor, he excites their, their disdain. Soli omnium opes adque inopium pari ad factu concupiscent. I said, of all peoples in the world, they are the only, the only ones who are greedy both for wealth and poverty. <laughs> and then he said, au fere trucidare rapere Falsis nomenibus imperium, ad qui ubi solitudinem vacuunt pacem appellant. Now this the, uh, is the 
the best definition of, of um, colonialism that I've seen in, in, any, in, in any writing. He said, Aufere, trucidare, rapere, falsis nominibus imperium, at qui ubi solitudinem faciunt, pacem appellant. He said, robbery, butchery, and rapine, the liars call empire. And when they make a desert, they call it peace. <laughs> and he said, he, he said, Bona in, Bona fortinaque in, in, uh, in tributum, age adque annos in, in frumentum, corpora ipsa et manus, silvis, at paludibus emunendis, intervebera et contumelius conturentu. He said, all our wealth is gone as taxes to Romans. All our harvests are taken to feed the Roman army. Even our very hands are worn away, draining bogs. And this, in spite of this, they are still heaping uh, abuses on us. He said, nata servituti Mancipia simil veniunt, ad qui altro ultro a dominis alunto. Britannia servitutem suam, quotidie emit, quotidie pacit. When a slave is bought, once bought, he is fed free by his master. But here in Britain, Britain has daily to pay for our own slavery and daily to feed it. Now, this, these are not Africans talking. These are white folks, but in those days, when they also were on the, You see, now this is, these are the various themes, no? And one can go on like that, on and on and on and on. But I think uh, we set out to do two things, to give you just a bird's eye view of writings that of the Africans before, before independence, after independence. And then I went, I, the second thing I did was to try to show, show that these themes are not peculiar to Africans alone. They are universal themes of literature. And any people, anywhere in the world, subjected to the same conditions as the Africans or as blacks have, have been, will write in the, exactly the same manner, if not more violent. And we have had proof from modern literature, Ireland, India, ancient literature, Britain, Gaul, and uh, the, in the, 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 the millions and the Greeks. So that is, um, Briefly, uh, what I set out to do, and I think here I will say, from my part, hic finis fandi. This is the end of speaking. <laughs> <laughs>